right, welcome back everybody. So today is actually our last lecture on the first third of the class. So it's our last time that we're gonna talk, present some couple few new ideas, but not too many, about imperative programming. This is it, we're almost done with kind of the, the first unit in this class, which is pretty exciting. Um, Today's a little bit of a mixed bag of stuff, so I have a couple, um, you know, constructs that I need to show you um, that are part of imperative programming in Java. They're not particularly common, but I need to make sure you've seen them so that I don't get in trouble later if somebody says, you know, of course on Java and he never showed you this particular type of loop or whatever. So we're going to look at a couple of those quickly. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what actually happens when your code runs. So this is something that may have been a little bit mysterious to you up until now. Um, it's actually pretty interesting, um, so we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. This will also help you understand why you get certain types of error messages, um, and there's kind of a fun story about language design here as well, right? So we'll talk about that. And then at the end, we're going to do some examples, I hope, um, where we're gonna look at the string rotation problem that you guys worked on a few uh, days ago, and we'll go over some examples of how to do that problem um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how not to do that problem as well. How to write like a good, clean, really perfect, correct solution to that particular problem. And that'll be something that'll, you know, again, hopefully help prepare you for the imperative programming midterm next week. Okay, so, let's get started. Two, two new things that I need to mention before we go on. And again, we're not gonna dwell here. Um, I showed you several types of loops. I showed you a while loop. That was actually the first loop that we talked about. We also looked at a for loop. So those were the, those are the, the heavy hitters. The for loop, you know, maybe like 60% of loops you see in the world. The while loop, you know, maybe 29% of the rest. But there's this other loop as well. So the while loop, remember we had, you know, this, this while keyword and then there's a condition. And this loop continues as long as that condition is true. While loop has a friend. That friend, or that variant, is called a do while loop. And you'll see that it's a little bit different. It starts with the keyword do, and then there's an open block, and then at the end, after the, the curly brace that closes the block of code that runs as the loop continues to execute, there's a while statement, and then there's a condition. So the structure of the statement is designed to be indicative of how it's different from the while loop. So you may have never used one of these loops before, and you won't use it often. But what do you think is different about it from the while loop? Just because of how it looks. It's a clue based on structure. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. So the do while loop, it's exactly correct. The do while loop runs first and then checks the condition. So a while loop can never execute. If the condition is false, we'll never enter the while loop. A do while loop will always execute once, because even if the condition is false, it doesn't get checked until after each time the loop executes. So just a quick example. Up top, I have a while loop, and that while loop is looping based on this condition that says i is less than zero. I've initialized i to zero. So the first time I reach the loop that starts on line two, it doesn't get executed. I do the same thing below with my do while loop. I initialize again i to zero. I have the same condition, but because it's a do while loop, it gets checked after the loop runs. So if I run this code, you're gonna see that the do while loop runs one time. The while loop never ran. If I change i here, let's set i to be, I don't know, 2 or something. Um, oh, wait, hold on. I need to, need to change the, let's, let's keep i starting at 0. Let's change the condition here. Um, so now you'll see that, that this is good. these are going to do the same thing, right? Um, but the condition is being checked at the end in the do while loop. Right. So there's this special case. So if I set this to two, I'm okay. If I set it to one, they're gonna do the same thing. But if I set it to zero, that's where they behave differently. It's just checked at the end. Okay, so you've seen the do while loop? 
Again, there will probably be like a multiple choice question on, on next week's midterm on this or something like that, but this is not something that we expect you to use. There are cases when you write code where you will maybe in the back of your mind keep this stashed away because there's a few places where a do while loop can actually lead you to a very elegant solution to a problem that you were kind of struggling to, to solve with the while loop. All right, so just keep this in your back pocket. It, it does come in handy uh, from time to time. Okay, so that's our do while loop. So that was kind of a variant of a loop. Now let me show you a little bit of a variant of a conditional. So we have this conditional statement. Again, this is kind of good to talk about today. It's good review. So we have this conditional statement. Um, this is actually good from top to bottom. I check a condition A. If that condition is true, I execute the block of code that follows. If it's not, I continue checking other statements um, until I get to the bottom of my conditional expression. So this is how these conditionals work. Conditionals also have a friend or a variant. And this is probably, you know, again, the reason why I'm not talking about these until now is these are not particularly useful. They are helpful in, a certain, in certain places. So this has a friend that's called a switch statement. And a switch statement is, again, very similar to an if-else. Um, so how does it work? Switches are also more limited than if-else if statements. Um, so the only thing I can test in a switch statement are primitive types and strings in Java. That's it. Um, but here's what I can do in a switch that I can't do in an if-else statement. I can actually have multiple expressions that are matched by the same switch statement. So here's how a switch statement works. When I start executing the switch, what Java will do is it'll find the first case statement that matches, and then it'll continue executing code until it hits a break statement. So that's the way that I can have multiple statements that are executed. So let's look at this guy. So again, this is new syntax. I don't want to dwell, I don't want to linger here because this is not really that useful. It's not something that we're going to ask you to use on homework problems or on an MP, but I just want you to, to see it. Um, so what do we think happens here? So I have my switch statement. The thing that I'm, te the, the variable that I'm testing is enclosed in those parentheses. In this case, this is testing the quality of this integer. So essentially, case zero says if test is zero. Case one says if test is equal to one. Case two, if test is equal to two. In other languages, case statements actually have, uh, uh, are more flexible, like I can do more with them. But in Java, this is pretty much it. I can take a variable and I can compare it with a series of literals. So what do we think is going to happen here? What's the value of test when I start running this? Two, it's initialized and declared on line one. So I'm going to start with this statement right here. Oh, wait, hold on. So for the person who complained about my laser pointer, I now have this thing. This, be careful with this. This may blind you. Okay, ready? All right, look at that. Just, like, it hurts my eyes a little bit, right? Are you guys okay with this? This was like the most powerful one I could buy on Amazon. It may be too much. It actually has like a little key that you have to use to turn it on. Um, anyway, so we'll, tr we'll try it. If anyone needs to go to the eye doctor after this lecture, I, I uh, disclaim all responsibility for that. Um, all right, so on what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on, on this statement on line five because test is two, so I'm going to print C, but there's no break statement there, and so I'm going to keep going until I get to the bottom of the case statement. So I'm going to get to line six. This really is too much. Um, and then I'm going to get to line seven. Seven is a special statement in a, in a switch called a default. So if nothing else matches, that's what gets executed. So let's, let's try this. Let's see what happens. Okay, so I printed C, I printed D, I printed E. Uh, if I give something like six, you're going to see that I'm only going to print E. That's because the default case down here on line seven prints E. So if I don't find a match in the switch, I, I jump into that case. I, if I do find an earlier match, I keep just going down until I either get out of the switch statement or I hit a break. So if I start with zero, I'm going to get through all of them. I can, I can put a break statement in here. Oh, this is broken. Sorry. I need, a, I need to open a block here. Oh, it's very angry with me, too. Yep. Still very angry at me. Okay. Let me try doing this this way. So 
if I put a break statement inside this uh, switch statement, ooh, hello. Lot of suck. So now, okay, so now if I match on case zero, which I am, then I'm breaking. And the break will jump out of the switch statement and keep going. So it's sort of like a break in a loop. The break will cause me to not match to case one, not match to case two, um, keep going if I match to case one. If I use one here, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to start at case one. Case one prints B. Then I'm going to go down through case two, case three, and through the default case because I don't have any more break statements. Okay, so I'm done talking about switch statements. If you guys have questions about this, ask on the forum. Um, I don't want to dwell here because we don't use these very often, but I just want you to have seen it. Okay, questions about imperative programming generally. So again, you guys have a midterm next week that's covering this material. The, the midterm is identical in format to the quiz. The only difference is you can't drop it. It's also identical in point value. It's worth 2% of your grade. So don't panic. Um, you know, it is uh, designed to be a challenge. It's designed to give you a sense of, you know, how much of this material you've absorbed over the past month or so. Um, but it's going to be, and the, the difference between the midterm and the quizzes, the midterm is going to be cumulative. So the midterm, anything up to this point is fair game. It's not going to focus as much on the material from the past week. Okay, so, so now for the next maybe 25 minutes or so, I want to, I want to sort of pull back the curtain a little bit and, and explain some things to you about what has been actually happening when you run your code. So you've been typing code into our slide you know, a little slide environment, you've been typing code into Prairie Lair, and you've been typing code into Android Studio, and then you've been running it, you know, in various ways, hitting submit on Prairie Learn, maybe hitting the play button on Android Studio, or just hitting return on our, on our slide decks. What is actually going on when you do this? What are the steps that are involved in taking the code that you wrote in this Java programming language that we're all learning together, and actually having a machine execute it? What is actually going on? Um, and again, there's two reasons to talk about this. One is that it's cool and it's interesting. The second is that it will help you understand a little bit about what goes wrong and what can go wrong when your code is run. Okay. So, and, and again, you know, if you're a computer scientist, part of your job is to be curious about things, right? And this will also clear up some confusions. So. I'm also going to try to avoid going to, into a massive amount of detail here. This is really interesting, and you know, if you have questions, come by office hours, ask on the forum or whatever. Be happy to tell you more about this. There's some people that are involved with the class this semester, some of the CAs that are really interested in this kind of thing. They probably will chime in and, and give you really long, interesting answers to questions that you might have about this. But I'm going to try to provide a very high-level overview with an eye to having it be useful to you, again, as you encounter problems. Um, Okay, so here's what happens. When you run your code, I've been, sometimes I slip up. I've been trying to say when you execute your code or when you run your code, but there's actually two things that happen. There's two separate steps to this process that are both, you know, extremely distinct and both important. We've been lumping them together because we haven't talked about this yet. We haven't explained it. But when you run code, like when you type code into our slide tool and hit enter, there's actually two things that happen, two independent steps. So the first thing is, there's a piece of software that's called the Java compiler. This is computer code written by somebody, uh, maintained by somebody. That compiles your code. So this is the first step in the process. It's called compilation. What does that mean? In Java, what it means is that we're taking your Java source code written in the Java programming language, and we're translating it, or we're compiling it into a different representation of the same code. That representation is into what is really kind of another programming language, a much simpler one, that's called Java bytecode. So this is the first step. I have to take your Java source code and compile it into Java bytecode. I'm going to show you some examples of this in a minute. Errors that happen here are called compiler errors. So you guys have seen these. You've seen them on the slides. You've seen them in Prairie Learn. You've seen them on Android Studio. When the compiler generates an error, it means that 
Usually there's something syntactically incorrect about your code. I'll show you some compiler errors in a minute, but you've encountered them already. What does that mean? It means that the compiler, this piece of software, couldn't understand what you tried to write. And there's a lot of reasons that can happen. Um, if your code has, compi has compiler errors, there's no way to execute it. So I can't go any farther. This compilation step is required to get to the point where I can actually execute the code you wrote. And so, you know, somebody was, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the, how to deal with this on, in the quiz environment, right? But someone is asking, well, if I make small mistakes on the quiz, can I get partial credit? And this is, the, this is the sad reality of the situation. If you make mistakes that prevent the compiler from being able to compile your code, there's no way for us to test it at all. Right? It won't run. We can't get past this point. So there are certain types of small mistakes you can make when you're writing code that leave us completely unable to execute it. So even if we did want to give you partial credit by you know, giving you some points for some simpler test cases, and we will do this on the midterm, we can't because the compiler doesn't understand your code. Once the compiler has finished, so if your code is syntactically correct and the compiler can understand it, then the output from the compiler, so this special um, representation of your code called bytecode, is then executed by another piece of software called the Java Virtual Machine. And I will, again, we'll come back and talk about a little bit why this, why this works this way, right? But there are two steps here, okay? An error that occurs at that stage is sometimes called a runtime error because it occurs when your program runs. So we distinguish between compiler errors, compilation errors that occur uh, during the first step, and runtime errors. And these two classes of errors are very distinct and they're very important from a software development perspective, the difference between them. We'll come back and talk about them a little bit more in a minute. Okay, so, so let me give you an example of a compiler error, all right? So if I try to run this code in our script executor environment, um, sorry, this is, this is out of date. This should say MP1, okay? All right, so I'm trying to finish MP1. Um, and this is like, so es essentially, that when, we, when you, you can try to submit this, the first thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna give this to the Java compiler. I'm gonna say, see what you can make of this, all right? Um, and what it's going to say is something totally like, it has no idea what you're talking about. You can't communicate with the compiler like this. Maybe someday, right? Who knows? Within your lifetime, we may have these incredibly intuitive uh, programming languages that allow you to write code like you would write text. Like, dear computer, please finish the project that's due tomorrow. Thank you. Um, you know, you have to say thank you, though, right? If you don't say thank you, it won't work, right? It expects to be... And there's, there's a digression that could go down here that I won't, but, but there is like a weird programming language that forces you to say thank you. And it is, I'm serious, I mean, look it up. Um, it, people, people actually develop weird programming languages for fun. I don't know, that's a strange thing to do, I think, but people do that, right? So one of them, one of the requirements was if you didn't say thank you often enough, it wouldn't work, right? If you said thank you too much, it would also not work, right? Because then it would be like, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're kissing, you know, you're kissing up to me. Um, Anyway, uh, Java doesn't work that way, but it also won't compile this code. So this is not syntactically correct Java code. Has, and the error message here that I'm getting is not particularly useful, right? It has no idea what to make of this. The Java compiler cannot compile human uh, language, right? Okay, that probably doesn't surprise us. Here's another example of a compiler error. So now at least we're making a, you know, a reasonable attempt to write Java code. But the compiler also will point out problems with our code. And what's the problem with the code here that the compiler is going to point out? Yeah, come back. Well, I have a, yeah, so I have a string literal to the right side of this assignment. It's called finish mp1 now. And I'm trying to assign it to an int variable. I'm going to use this again. Watch out, right? So on the left side, I've got this int called instructions, and I'm trying to initialize it with the string literal. And so the Java compiler here, different programming languages work differently, but the Java compiler has been programmed in such a way that it will not allow me to do this. It will, it will say something is wrong with the statement. And this time the error message is a little bit more useful because I'm actually trying to write real Java code. 
So in this case, again, I have a, com I have a compiler error. This is compilation fail. And then it tells me the line number and, and assignment conversion not possible from type string to type int. So what it's saying here is that I've got a string on the right side and I've got an int variable on the left side and I can't convert those. I won't convert them for you. I don't know how. So this is a compiler error. This code never executed. It didn't compile. Okay. So what about this? Will this code compile? Is it syntactically correct Java code? I've got a variable called string. I'm initializing it to null. That special value that indicates that um, that variable refers to nothing. And then I'm printing its length. Will this code compile? This is syntactically correct Java code. And the compiler will allow me to compile this code. Now, you might wonder, why can I do this? Isn't the compiler smart enough to realize that I created a variable called s, I initialized it to null, and then I'm trying to use one of its methods. This is not going to work. But this does not produce a compiler error. Now what I'm getting is what's called a runtime error, an execution failure. So this code compiled fine. That was not the problem. The problem is when Java ran it, it encountered this problem. The problem it encountered was because I took a object, I initialized it to null, which is that special value that indicates that uh, there's no actual object there, and then I tried to use, in this case, one of its methods called length. And this will cause a runtime error. So this error was not caught when I tried to compile the code. This is really important. Instead, it occurred when I tried to run it. When you guys use Prairie Learn, when you use Android Studio, when we do this in class, these two steps are lumped together. So when you submit code through our slide playground, we compile it, and then we try to run it right away. And so it's easy to confuse these two stages, but the output from this tool is designed to help you figure out what happened. So this says execution failed, and then it gives you some information about what happened. So one of the things that's happened in the you know, decades since Java came out, and this is a feature of modern programming languages, is when we design programming languages, and when we, particularly when we design compilers, we want to take errors that might occur at runtime and transform them into compiler errors. So ideally, the, and this is not possible, but it's more possible now than it was a few decades ago, ideally any problem that your program would run into as it runs that would cause it to crash or fail, would be identified when we compiled your code. That's, again, that's impossible, but there's a larger and larger category of errors that we're trying to move from being runtime errors to compile time errors. Why is this? Yeah. Okay, so it does make them easier to clean up, but why? Yeah, David. Exactly, yeah, so that's exactly why. Compiler errors happen when you're developing your code. They happen when some software developer, you someday, is sitting at a desk or standing at a desk somewhere, you know, in Seattle or Silicon Valley or Berlin or wherever you are, right, and you're working on the code, you're compiling it. That's when those errors get caught. That's way before anybody has tried to use your app. That's way before you've deployed it. That's way before, you know, a million people have downloaded it and installed it on their phones and run it. So if you can catch those errors during compile time, when you're developing, then they'll never occur when a client or, you know, a user or somebody runs the code. So that's why runtime errors are so problematic, because a runtime error causes your app to crash when someone tries to use it. How many people have downloaded an app from the App Store and like the first time you open it, it crashes right away? What do you do with that app? Uninstall, right? Doesn't work, you know? There's nothing I can do with it, right? If, the, if, if whoever created that app knew that that was going to happen when they were working on it, 
They could have fixed whatever problem you run into, you ran into, and you never would have had that experience. But as a user, that experience even, so how many people have downloaded an app and it seems to work, kind of sometimes, but there are times when it crashes. So again, that app might also be headed for the trash. Depends, so sometimes you're stuck. It's like the app that came with this stupid robotic vacuum that you bought, so it's like, too bad, it crashes, there's no other way to use it. Um, but if you have other choices, you might think, eh, you know, let's like, say it's a mail client. There's like 10 different, 20 different, 30 different mail clients out there that I can use on my phone. Maybe I'll get, just go get another one, right? Because this one doesn't seem to work. So these, compi these compile time errors are easy to catch during the development process. And anything that I can catch during compile time are things that I don't expose to users. They're bugs that a user will never see. And so again, you might wonder, and this is partly the result of the fact that Java is a fairly old language. And the Java compiler was designed at a time where computers were a lot slower. So you might, again, you might wonder, why on earth can I do this? I wonder this too. There's no good answer to this. This code will compile. So you could create an app that in its onCreate method did this. And you could put it on the App Store. And your friends could download it. And you know exactly what's going to happen when it runs, right? I have a variable called s that I initialize to note, and then I call a method on it immediately. There's no way for this code not to fail. So you might wonder, why does Java allow me to do this? It's a great question. It is not a question that I have a good answer to. Complain to the Java people. Um, there are newer languages, though, where this code will not compile. Because the compiler is smart enough to realize, hey, wait. You know, I don't know if you're just dumb or don't know how to program or it's really late at night or your partner checked in this code or whatever, um, but this is a clear problem. I can tell what's going to happen here. I, I shouldn't compile this code because it's never going to work. It's always going to cause a problem. But again, the fact that I can do this with Java is a legacy a little bit of, of the age of this language and, and where it came from. Okay, so let, let me do a quick demo here. I want to show you guys the pieces of this, of this tool chain. So I'm going to turn this guy off for a minute. And then I'm going to cast my whole desktop so that you can see. Okay, so can people read this? Should I make it bigger? Make it bigger. Uh, how about that? Good? In the back? Okay. So... Um, don't be scared by the environment. Right? This is how I work. I'm, I'm older than you are, right? Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a file. Um, I'm going to call this example.java, and I'm going to edit it um, to contain some Java code. I'm adding this special um, magic method that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And I'm, all I'm going to do here is call... Oh, I have to spell it right. All I want this program to do is print uh, hello world to the console. System.out.println works here too. So now I've got, let me show you this, I've got a file containing some valid Java code. That's what you guys do. And then there's two steps to this process, I promise. The first one is compiling it. So I'm going to run a program called Java C. That is the Java compiler. And I'm going to ask it to compile the code contained in this file. And if I've done my work properly, it's done. If it doesn't complain, it means it succeeded. What happened? Well, let me look at the code in this file again. It's the same. So I told you that the Java compiler produces something from this source code. It takes it and creates bytecode. So where did the bytecode go? The bytecode, let me show you something. There's a new file in this directory. When I started, there were no files in this directory. I created a file called example.java. That's my code. There's now a new file in this directory called example.class. That is Java bytecode. If I try to just um, pr look at this um, directly, it's not going to be, yeah, so that's like, if you tried to open this up in a text editor, not, not very useful. But there is a little program that comes with Java that allows me to peek at the bytecode that's contained. So what this program does is it 
uh, prints off the contents of this file. So what the compiler has done is it's taken my code that I wrote in the Java programming languages, Java programming language, and this is now what's called Java bytecode. And I don't understand you guys to expect, I don't expect you guys to understand this. I just want to show you what's in here. So this is a series of simpler instructions that are now ready to be run. Okay, so my code compiled, it got through stage one. Now let's execute it. So to execute it, I use this program called uh, the Java Virtual Machine. So before I ran Java C, that's the Java compiler. Now I'm just running Java. That's the Java uh, Virtual Machine. Again, I'll explain that in a minute. And that is what's going to execute my code. Oop, sorry. Um, there we go. So it prints Hello World. Okay, good. So that, and, and these are the two steps that we perform in pretty much using these exact programs, particularly when you submit things like the homework problems. And this is what's happening behind the curtain when you use Android Studio. So let's say I made a mistake in my Java file. I'll just get rid of a semicolon. Now, when I try to compile it, you're going to see an error message. And this is you know, pretty similar to the types of error messages you guys have seen in, in other types of environments. But the problem here is that my code didn't compile. And let me get rid of that class file that I created before. So you'll see, if I try to compile code in Java that won't compile, the Java compiler doesn't create any output because this is invalid, right? So it says, I can't generate the output I want to because your code has a problem. If I fix that problem, and try compiling the code again. Now it works, and you'll see that this output file has been created again. So these are the building blocks. And again, I know this is scary. The environment's scary. You guys will learn more about how to use your computer this way when you get to 126 or 225. Um, but, but these are these little pieces of software that are involved in this process, right? the Java compiler and the Java virtual machine. Okay, so. Going back to the slides now, I'm going to stop this. Cool. Okay. So there's a little demo with Java C. Right? So that was the compiler. And then this thing called the Java Virtual Machine. Okay. So, another mini digression. I guess I'll, pr I'll promise to keep this quick. What is, so in other, there are other programming languages, like C and C++, where what the compiler produces is actually code that a computer processor can execute. So in my computer, in all of your computers, there is this extremely expensive, extremely complex, this is sort of like one of the flowerings of modern civilization, right? If, 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 you know, if, if somehow you know, we wipe ourselves off the face of the planet and aliens land here, you know, millions of years from now and are excavating our civilization, and they find this. This is one of the things that's going to impress them. They probably have something like it. They probably have better ones, right? This is a computer processor. This is an incredibly, you know, complex, sophisticated piece of hardware. It's not that big. How many people have seen one before? Okay, yeah, I mean, it's like maybe that big. Little piece of, of, of silicon. Um, usually, like, if, if your laptop costs X amount of money, about half of that is the processor itself. It's by far the most complex, costly, and sophisticated part of the laptop. It doesn't look like much. If you don't know what it looks like and you start, don't do this, right? Because you'll never put it back together again. Um, if you took apart your laptop, right, and you started digging around in there, you're going to find all this stuff that looks cool and complicated, but the thing that's actually doing most of the work is nestled, you know, in there very carefully, um, and again, doesn't end up looking like much, right? You might actually miss it. But other programming languages, when you compile, you, what you end up with are actually uh, instructions that, for example, this computer processor can execute. In Java, I don't get that. I get this thing called bytecode. So machine code is code that can actually be run by a machine, by a computer processor. Bytecode requires this additional uh, piece of software. So again, a lot of compiled languages compile into code that can be run by a processor. Java does not. Instead, Java forces you to run that code using another piece of software called this Java virtual machine. So why did this happen? 
So again, I'm going to uh, try to avoid going on a massive digression here, but this is a super interesting story. So when Java, so at the time Java was being designed and created, and this is still true today, although it's less true than it used to be, different computers use different processors, and those different processors use different instructions. So it's almost as if, you know, two computers in the same room, the processors speak different languages. When I compile my code to machine code, I have to choose whether it's going to run on machine A or machine B. And this creates a problem. Now, this is still true today, but it's true in a different way. So, you know, 30 years ago, if we went through this room and looked at your laptops, like when I was in school, for example, Apple laptops still used a different kind of processor than PCs. This is no longer the case. However, there is a computing device that we, you have with you that uses a different kind of processor. Do you know what it is? It's your smartphone. So today, this is really interesting, we're in a really interesting place in computing history. Your laptops, I would probably venture to guess, 98, 99% of them use Intel processors. You see in the commercials, Intel inside, whatever. Your phones do not. They use a line of processors from a company called ARM. It's a completely, so these two processors now don't speak the same language. Most phones use one type of processor. Most of your PCs use a different one. And that's, a, again, that's an interesting place. That's just kind of where we are in computing history. Intel spent a lot of time and energy building processes for certain types of environments, and they kind of missed the boat when it came to smartphones, and they're way behind in that market. Will they catch up? I don't know. We'll see. But at the time Java was being designed, this was even more of a concern. Um, and so there was this, so if I take a program that, I've, that I have ready, so let's say you, you create your app, and I try to run it on a phone that doesn't use that kind of processor, it's going to fail. The idea with Java was that if I take a, a compiled piece of Java code, like that Java class file that you just saw me create, I could send that to you, and you could run it on your phone. You could run it on a, a, a weird you know, laptop. I shouldn't say weird. There's a lot of netbooks that don't use Intel processors. You could run on your netbook. You could run it anywhere. So this was the Java slogan. Um, but the requirement is that that computer has to have this piece of software called the Java Virtual Machine. So, and, and this is also, when you guys installed, well, you actually didn't have to install Java this semester, thank God. Uh, that's a lot, we used to have to install Java as part of getting you set up to work on the MPs. Um, now, we don't, but if you've installed Java, you might have wondered, like, what's the difference between the Java Software Development Kit and what's called the Java Runtime Environment? So the Java runtime environment does not include the Java compiler. It only includes the Java virtual machine. The Java software development kit is what you need if you're going to build Java programs. It still includes the Java virtual machine, so you can run the programs that you create, but it also includes the Java compiler, that Java C program. And this was uh, Java's slogan. Write once, run anywhere. That was the goal behind Java when this language was designed uh, you know, many years ago. Now, one of the things, you know, I said before that's happening is as computers get faster, compilers are also getting more powerful. And this is starting to have an effect on Java, too. So I just want to show you this, because this is sort of fun, right? Maybe I should start changing the course to accommodate for this. But this is now valid Java code. What's wrong with this? If I put this on a quiz and said, you know, is this valid Java, what would you say? What's wrong with this? Looks like JavaScript, yeah. What's var, right? So I have something that looks like a variable definition. Sorry, declaration and initialization. I have something called integer value that looks like the name. I have an assignment to the right to five. What kind of literal is five? It's an int literal. So what am I missing here? Aren't I supposed to also have to tell Java that this is an int? So what is this var thing? Turns out, this is valid Java code. So a new version of Java that came out last year called Java 10 introduced something that's called local variable type inference. That's a mouthful. What does that mean? So you might have wondered, when you write this code, 
you're actually telling Java that integer value is an int twice. The first way you tell it is you have to declare it as an int. And then the second way you're telling it is you're assigning it to phi, which is an int literal. So you might have wondered, like, why do I have to do this? Why isn't, why isn't Java smart enough to realize if I create a variable, and as soon as I declare it, I also initialize it to a literal value, that that's the type of that variable? So now you can do this for local variables in Java. You do not need to specify a type if the compiler can figure out what type the variable should be based on something else that you've done, typically based on initialization. So you can use this. You cannot use this feature in Android Studio, I don't think, um, if, you were, if you were developing code, because Android Studio is using an older version of Java. Uh, you can use it on our Prairie Learn homework problems. And you can now use it on some of our slide playground examples. It doesn't work everywhere. But here's one place that it does work. So again, most of this looks like code that we've seen before. I have a small loop that's just adding up some numbers. But at the top, I have this completely new piece of syntax where I have not had to tell Java, so I can replace this with int if I want to, and the code still runs. But now I can use this new Java keyword called var, and it works. How does this work? It works because when the compiler compiles this code, here's what it does. It says, okay, on line one, I see that you're declaring a local variable called sum. And you use this var keyword. So I'm not sure what the type is yet. But how does it tell the type? You would initialize it to zero. Zero is an int literal. Therefore, sum is an int. So that's how it determines what the type is. This is known as type inference. I'm inferring the type of this variable from, in this case, the assignment. OK. A few more things to cover here before, before I wrap up. So when, when, I, when I wrote that piece of code previously, you saw me write a method called main. In the past, you would have seen main by now, because the programming assignments we used to do that weren't on Android had main methods. But now you haven't seen it yet. You saw it briefly on that little example. Um, but what is, so there's this special method called main. We're going to start using this in class as we start doing examples that use objects. But I want to talk a little bit about what it is. So main is a, is a special method in Java. Um, it always has this signature. And, and none of this is going to make sense to you yet, but it will soon. Some of it might. Void should make sense. That's the return type of main. Main makes sense. That's the name of a function. Public static don't make sense yet, but they will in a week or so. And then I'm, I'm passing main a list of, of, of arguments. Main gets a single argument called, in this case, unused, because I'm not doing anything with it. And the type of that is it's an array of strings. And then I, I print something. So then I have some code. So then it's just another method. So what is main? Why is this method special? Well, you might wonder, when Java starts running my code, where does it start? I run, I write a function. That function could call other functions. So if I start somewhere in the code, I can sort of trace to figure out what's going to happen. But when I run, when I ran that code before using the Java virtual machine, how did it know where to start? By convention, it starts in this special method called main. And this is true, you know, of any Java program you write. It's always going to start in some main method somewhere. Like, which main method it starts in can, can differ. But when Java starts executing your program, it needs somewhere to begin. There has to be some method that gets called. Then that method can call other methods and other things can happen. But I have to start somewhere. It has to be a first line of code that I'm going to write, then I'm going to run. And that first line of code is the first line in my main method. So if your, uh, a particular part of your Java code has this method, that means that the Java virtual machine can start executing code there. Again, this will make more sense as we start to do the examples that involve objects. So here's a, just another interesting question here. Why does main get this argument? So main is passed an argument of strings. It's an array. So main can receive an array of strings that might contain zero strings, that might contain five strings. Does anyone know where these strings come from? 
I'll leave this as, a, as an exercise to the reader to find out. Like, where do these strings come from? In this case, I'm not using them. I'm not doing anything with them. But sometimes I would. Right? Okay. Any questions on this stuff before we do a little bit of end of class stuff? I think what I'll do is I'll save the string rotation stuff for our imperative review, which we'll do. Um, oh, hold on. I'll come back to that. I have a question for you guys. Next two lectures, one of them is going to be our first lecture on objects. The second one is going to be a review for the midterm. So there's two ways that we could do this, and I'm happy to do either. One way is that we do the midterm review on Friday. I think the pro of that is that it gets you started studying over the weekend. Uh, the con is that the midterm is, starts next Tuesday. So Monday is closer. The other option is on Friday we start talking about objects, and then we come back on Monday and do one lecture of midterm review. So who would rather do the midterm review on Friday? Okay, who would rather do it on Monday? I think the Fridays have it, so that's what we're going to do. So, Friday, midterm review, here. Uh, we'll do an hour of, you know, practice problems. I'll take questions. We'll go over some of those string rotation examples. Uh, that's what we're going to do. On Monday, we'll start objects. Now, next week's lab, hold on, simmer down. Next week's lab is also going to be midterm review. And the way that we're going to do that is that there will be no attendance taken in the lab. And you can go to any lab. My suggestion is that you go to a lab before your midterm, right? Because, you know, if you go to one after, it's sort of too late, right? Um, but I'm going to set this up so you guys are free to go to any lab. Now, you know, again, if you get to, you know, if, you go, if, if everyone tries to go to, like, the last two labs on Wednesday, um, it's not going to work out very well. Um, so please be a little strategic about that. If you go to a lab that already has too many people in it, it's unlikely you're going to be able to get help. But next week, no attendance in lab. Go to any lab you want. The, the lab will be entirely devoted to helping you review for the midterm. Right? So we'll essentially sort of do open office hours. Okay. I don't have time for this, which is fine. Um, so look. We are at a tough point in the semester. I understand that. Right? We're, we're pushing you guys. Um, you know, we've picked up a little steam over the past few days. This week's quiz is hard. Um, you guys are doing, still doing better than last fall, though, which was really impressive to me. Um, this week's quiz is hard. Next week's midterm is also hard. MP1 is hard. But here's the thing. If you get through this and you don't give up and you keep your feet moving, you will do well in this class. You know, the, the people that made it to the finish line last semester got good grades in the course, right? The way that you fail in this class is if you give up. So don't do that. Come to office hours. Um, tomorrow, Friday, um, ask questions on the forum, get ready for the midterm. You, you guys are okay, right? Midterm score, the exams, quiz scores are going down a little bit. That's normal. Um, but, you know, don't give up, right? Okay, so, a couple of announcements. We'll do that next time. If, this is important. So, there, I've received several requests for, from people who are in the James Scholars Program to do an interview. Last semester I did like eight of these, okay? And I don't like talking about myself that much, and by the end I'm telling you really weird things, right? Because I'm trying not to make them different. So what I'm going to do is that on Friday there's no class after us here in Lincoln Hall, so I'm just going to stick around. If you want to do a James Scholar interview, Friday at 11 a.m. is your opportunity, right? If you also just want to hear me talk about random stuff, you can stick around Friday as well, right? If you can't make that, tough. Um, so on Friday, we're going to do midterm review based on popular demand. On Monday, we're going to start talking about objects. We've got office hours going on for MP1, but this is also a great chance to start going through some of those homework problems, get ready for the midterm. Um, next week's the midterm, right? Good luck on today's quiz if you're taking it. Good luck on MP1. I will see you guys on Friday.